That's a clown question, bro. So I'm gonna kick some dirt. He gets on base. Just a bit outside. I'm not the type of player that's gonna be Johnny Hustle. If you don't want me to watch the ball, you can go get it out of the ocean. And welcome to the show to be named later, where we're talking baseball kind of whenever. I'm your host, Chris Gianta. Over there on the other side of the screen is Daniel Curran. How you doing, Daniel? Chris, we got some inter-squad matchups this week. We got Bo Bichette, uh going deep every single day, it seems like. We got Jared Kalanick, a lot of Mariners youngsters that have been going deep a lot, Kyle Lewis. Evan White, I've you know I've seen a Seattle. I see those youngsters out there. We've got you know inner squad. Did you see uh, Francisco Lindor take Clevenger deep and doing somersaults as he crossed home plate? Yeah, it was. Uh, that's fantastic television. Yeah, Mr. that that is that in a real game though. Do yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I would love that. We're not quite there. Maybe like maybe in twenty thirty five. Maybe in the World Baseball Classic, we'll be there. Yeah, we'll just it's it's, it's way it's, more acceptable there. It's an evolution, you know. Yeah. You, have to, you start at like, you know, you start at like I bet I bet back in like if back you know when automatic home runs happened in like eighteen eighty three, they probably just sprinted <laughs> around the bases because if they trotted, that would probably be disrespect back then but now you know it, there, there's an evolution to uh you know letting the kids play as they say love it love it and uh yeah hopefully hopefully he's still playing this year yeah don't want to get don't want to get any bad thoughts out there but today we have someone we're talking about someone who uh you know not on the same level as trout in terms of getting on base but did get on base a lot got got his walks and uh, definitely overlooked because – probably because of his low average. We've got Eddie Matthews today, mm-hmm. uh, who, you know, it's important to talk about Matthews because uh, he was probably – he was like the first big-time offensive third baseman, at least of the live ball era. Um, it had been thought of pretty much entirely as a, you know, a guy who can play defense uh, and, you know, probably hit – hit for average, but not be like a power guy. Yep. Eddie Matthews flipped that on his head. And now, you know, now you think of third base, you think of primarily power hitters um, who also, you know, can do it with a glove as well. You know, Nolan Arenado, Matt Chapman, Anthony Rendon, the list goes on. But Eddie Matthews, Eddie Matthews' life started when he was born in Texarkana, Texas. And, you know, we talk about the, the Texas, Florida, California thing, how most American baseball players, especially like post-integration, they came from Florida, Texas, or California. Eddie was born in Texas he and was. moved to California uh, when he was four years old. So he's born in Texas, raised in California. He checked uh, off two out of three. Yeah, checked off two out of three. Just like uh, Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan was born in Texas, raised in California. And Eddie Matthews, so he moved to Santa Barbara, California when he was four years old, and sports were definitely a big influence on him. This is a quote from, this is a quote from Society of American Baseball Research. It says, my mother used to pitch to me, or uh, my mother used to pitch to me, and my father would shag balls, uh, Matthews are called many, many years later. If I hit one up the middle close to my mother, I'd have some extra chores to do. My mother was instrumental in ma- in making me a pro hitter. So uh, Eddie Matthews got BP uh, from his from his mother. Love interestingly that. enough, you don't see that a lot. They don't. And yeah, made sure she didn't she didn't hit her, or made sure uh, he didn't hit her. So uh, ended up being a big pull hitter, uh, for better or for worse. And he was excellent in both football and baseball. And he was actually offered college scholarships for football. Uh, However, he became one of the most sought after baseball prospects in the country. And before, uh, or because of the rules stating that a player could not be signed until after a player graduated high school, Matthew signed with the Boston Braves 
minutes after midnight on the date of his graduation. You wasted no time. Waste, yeah, wasted zero time there at all. Uh, and he signed with the Boston Braves. So now as a minor league player, Eddie Matthews is ready to get out there. And he showed it on the field. In 1949, his first year as a professional baseball player, he hit 363. That was his average. And he slugged 683 in 63 games in Class D High Point Thomasville. And uh, that was about it for his 1949. You know, pretty impressive on paper. And in 1950, he hit 286 and slugged 536 with 32 home runs and 146 games in Double A Atlanta. So, you know, the stats aren't as good, but as, but, you know, they even out more with the uh, higher sample size. So that was his first two minor league seasons. He's doing pretty well for himself. Uh, however, he misses 1951, most of it due to a Korean war service. He had to miss time due to the war. And after spending a few months in the Navy, he received a hardship discharge because of his father's illness, which made him the only source of his income for his family, which resulted uh, to him being allowed to come back home. Uh, fortunately for the Braves and for Eddie, uh, he did not have to risk his life in the war and could continue his baseball dream. So in 1951, in the few games he did play, 47 to be exact, he hit 292 and slugged 540 uh, at both double A and triple A. And in spring training of 1952, he battled for the third base job with 1947 NL MVP Bob Elliott. And Matthews won the battle at the age of 20 because Elliott was traded. So now Eddie Matthews is in the big leagues. He makes his MLB debut on April 15th, 1952, five years to the date after Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier. In 1952, he led uh, qualified National League rookies in OPS with a 767. And he also led NL rookies in position player B war. He led the MLB rookies in home runs with 25. And he finished 21st in the MVP vote and third in the Rookie of the Year vote. And after years of decline in attendance, the Braves owners decided to move from Boston to Milwaukee. So then in Milwaukee, uh, Eddie Matthews becomes probably the first, uh, the first baseball star in Milwaukee. And this is because in 1953, uh, he just turned it on. Through his first 40 games, uh, he hit 15 home runs and 40 RBI with an 1184 OPS. This was while the team was 27 and 13 and leading the National League. Just one year. This is just one year removed from the uh, Boston Braves going 64 and 89 and finishing seventh out of eight in the National League. I mean, this is a turnaround that not many had seen before. And for the final 114 games, Matthews uh, had a 983 OPS, still elite, and the Braves ended up going 65 and 49, which was still very good. But they, the Braves could not keep up with the Brooklyn Dodgers, who ended up going 105 and 49. And uh, no one can really keep up with that. So who can play him? The Milwaukee Braves in 1953. But Eddie Matthews, he finished second in runs batted in with 135 and third in OPS with a 1033 OPS. He led the league in home runs with 47. He led the league in OPS plus with 171. And he also led the league in weighted runs created plus with 167. And Matthews did it, was especially good with runners in scoring position. He hit 376 with a 1312 OPS with runners in scoring position. And his average with runners in scoring position ranked fifth minimum 50 plate appearances with runners in scoring position. And his OPS ranked first. So he was he was elite with runners in scoring position. This resulted in Matthews finishing second in both B war and F war. And at the time, his 47 home runs were the most by a third baseman in a single season. And that would not be topped for another 16 years uh, when Harmon Killebrew did it in 1969. And mm -hmm. this leads to some, some records uh, or some, you know, some reference points in terms of Matthews' age because 
Matthews did this when he was in his age 21 season. He was. That's right. You know, he, I, I'm a year younger than Eddie Matthews doing this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah. quite unreal. I don't, I don't think I'm a year away from uh, hitting 47 home runs in the big leagues at all. Yeah, that's uh, a 171 OPS plus. Probably not. Probably not. However, for players in their age 21 season or younger in a single season, uh, Matthews is uh, OPS ranked seventh. His uh, RBI ranked fourth. Or, and this is this is throughout time. So this is up to 2019. So his for age for players in their age 21 season or younger in a single season all time uh, his OPS ranks seventh his RBI ranks fourth his slugging ranks third his OPS plus ranks third and his home runs still rank first no one has uh no one has ever had more home runs in a single season in their age 21 season or younger How about that? so that's quite quite a big deal also, for players in their age 21 season or younger in a single season, uh, Eddie Matthews' B war ranks seventh, his F war ranks sixth, his offensive runs above average ranks sixth, and his uh, offensive wins above replacement ranks fourth. Also, it is the only season by someone in their age 21 season or younger with 120 plus RBI and an OPS plus of 170 or better How about that? and that results in eddie matthews finishing second in the 1953 national league mvp vote so we are on to 1954 now and he finished fifth in ops that season with a 10 10 26 third in weighted runs created plus with 168 and second in ops plus with a 172 he topped his weighted runs created plus and his ops plus by one point from the previous season. He also hit 312 with a 507 OBP with runners in scoring position. He got on pace half the time when there was a man on second or third. And his he hit 40 home runs this season, and he remains the only player in baseball history with multiple 40 home run seasons before their age 23 season. How about that? He finished fourth in baseball reference war and third in Fangraphs war only good for 19th in the MVP vote and on August 16th was featured on the cover of the first ever issue of Sports Illustrated interesting very interesting you know he's a young baseball star baseball was definitely the most popular sport at the time so it makes a lot of sense it makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense that he was on the cover of that first Sports Illustrated so then in 1955, he just continues what he's doing. He finishes third in OPS with a 1014 OPS, second in weighted runs created plus with 167, and second in OPS plus with 170. He also led the league in walks with 109, uh, and he finished fourth in baseball reference war and fourth in F war. That resulted in him finishing 18th in the MVP vote, uh, not a big correlation between his war and his MVP voting. What are you gonna do? And Matthews had his third 40 home run season, which are the most 40 home run seasons before an age 24 season. How about that? Also, his three qualified seasons with an OPS plus of 170 or better before his age 24 season are tied with Ty Cobb for the most such seasons. How about that? So we are in 1956, and this is where Eddie Matthews, Warren Spahn, and Hank Aaron take over the National League. In 1956, Eddie Matthews finished eighth in OPS with an 892, fifth in OPS plus with a 143, and fifth in weighted, rate, weighted runs created plus with also 144. He finished seventh in B war and seventh in F war, seventh on both websites. He, fin he hit a 320 with a 485 OBP with runners in scoring position. And he currently holds the record for most home runs in a career before their age 25 season with 190. How about that? 
And after going 81 and 49 and establishing a three and a half game lead in the National League, the Braves finished 11 and 12 and lost the pennant by one game. So then in 1957, it is time for redemption. Eddie Matthews has another very, very good season, finishes sixth in OPS with 927, fourth in OPS plus with 154, and fourth in weighted runs created plus with also 154. He finished third in baseball reference war and third in F war, both behind Willie Mays and teammate Hank Aaron. So Eddie Matthews and Hank Aaron at the top of the leaderboards. And by the end of 1957, uh, Eddie Matthews already had the most career home runs for a third baseman. He's in his age 25 season, and he mm -hmm. already has the most career home runs for a third baseman. I mean, it does say something about Eddie Matthews for sure, but it also tells you about uh, the state of third base before Eddie Matthews joined the league. And the team ended up going 95 and 59. Uh, no worries about a, a late a late collapse and the Braves ended up winning the pennant in 1957 getting them into Eddie Matthews's first uh, career World Series so in the first three games of the series however Eddie Matthews was uh, you know not exactly producing for the offense he went he went 0 for 8 but he did have five walks in the first three ga games of the World Series however in game four, with the Braves uh, trailing the series two games to one, uh, Eddie Matthews had an opportunity to redeem himself. You know, after going 0 for 8, uh, game four, he, he kind of turns it around here. So in the bottom of the 10th, in the bottom of the 10th, with one, uh, with one man on, one man out, it is time. The game is tied 5 to 5. And Eddie Matthews is up at the plate. It's Eddie Matthews at the plate. And he connects. Hank Bauer moves back, but the ball is out of reach. A home run and a 7 to 5 Milwaukee victory. It was nothing new for Eddie as he had hit 32 homers during the 1957 season. Matthews Homer has even the series at 2 and 2. And his teammates give Eddie a hero's welcome. Scrappy, Milwaukee Braves, and their courageous left-hander Warren Swan have turned what looked like a heartbreaking defeat into a great victory. So there it is. Eddie Matthews walk-off home run in the World Series. How many people can say that they that they've done that? Santa Maria. Santa Maria. There it is for Eddie Matthews. And in games five and six, uh, Eddie Matthews had the exact same, uh, exact same batting line. He went one for three in a walk and with a walk, one for three with a walk in both games, both game five and six. Um, and the Braves and the Yankees split those games, uh, making, making the uh, series go to a game seven. And in game seven, with the game still scoreless in the third inning. Uh, Eddie Matthews broke the game open with a two-run double, giving right. the Braves the lead, two to nothing, and the Braves' lead would would be there to stay. And in the ninth inning, uh, the bases were loaded in a five-nothing game, adding some pressure to the situation. And with two out, bases loaded, in Game Seven of the World Series, here we are.
and the Milwaukee Braves are the new world champions with a five to nothing victory. So there it is. The Braves are World Series champions in 1957. Eddie Matthews is a World Series champion in 1957. Can't take, can't take that ring away, that's for sure. Matthews ended up with a 933 OPS in the series, and with runners in scoring position, he went two for five with two walks. So he definitely did, did all he could uh, to make sure the Braves won that World Series. And in 1958, Matthews would avoid the World Series hangover on an individual level. He had an 807 OPS. He finished third in the league in home runs with 31. And despite a bit of a drop in offensive production, he still finished fifth in baseball reference war and fifth in fan graphs war because he finished seventh in defensive war and uh, had six defensive runs above average. Uh, yeah. And and Logan said, quote, Eddie was a below average fielder, went into a good third baseman. The team went 92 and 62 and won the pennant. Uh, however, Matthews had a 563 OPS in a World Series loss, but he went two for nine with two walks with runners in scoring position. So that leads into 1959. The Braves are still knocking at the door of that National League pennant. They're, you know, twice defending National League champions. And they were four and a half games behind the Dodgers with 20 games left in the season. Uh, but, uh, you know, in these 20 games, the Braves went 15 and five and tied and uh, tied with the Dodgers for the National League pennant. Uh, and Matthews tore it up during this stretch. Uh, they, he had uh, nine home runs and 21 RBI during this 20 game stretch. And, the uh, you know the Braves and Dodgers are tied for the National League pennant. They have to play a best of three series um, to determine who's going to uh, represent the National League in the World Series in 1959. And the Braves mm -hmm. lost each of the first two games by one, and they actually blew a three-run lead in the ninth of, in Game Two. And Matthews ended up uh, with going two for eight with two walks and a home run combined uh, in that, you know, short two game series. And in the season, Matthews ended up finishing second in OPS, you know, take from that, from that drop in offensive production in 1958 goes right back up with a 983 OPS finishing second in the national league. He finished second in OPS plus with 168 and second in weighted runs created plus with 166, uh, all behind his teammate Hank Aaron, so it was it was Matthews and Aaron dominating the National League once again, and Matthews also led the league in home runs with 46, once again leading the league in home runs, and at the time, it was the second most home runs by a third baseman in a single season, and that's right, you're remembering that correctly, uh, the best. The most home runs in a single season by a third baseman up to that point was Eddie Matthews in 1953. So he had the most home runs by a third baseman in a single season and the second most uh, home runs by a third baseman in a single season up to that point. And also it was his fourth 40 home run season and only two other third basemen up to that point had at least one 40 home run season. No and no other third baseman up to that point had more than one 40 home run season. That's right. He had, he had four 40 home run seasons. No one else, uh, no other third baseman in baseball history up to that point had more than one. And Matthews ended up finishing third in baseball reference war and second in F war for that 1959 season and he finished second in the MVP vote. So he is now continuing his dominance uh, with Hank Aaron in the beginning of the 1960s. And in 1960, he finishes second in OPS with a 948, an OPS plus of 166 and a weighted runs created plus of 165. 
He hit 386 with one runners in scoring position and minimum 50 plate appearances with runners in scoring position. He led the league in average, uh, with, of course, with runners in scoring position. He finished second in RBI with 124 behind Hank Aaron, and he finished second in war on both websites and 10th in the MVP vote. And by the end of 1960, which was his age 28 season, he had the highest career F war by a third baseman. So Matthews obviously dominating the third base position like no one had ever seen. And in 1961, he continues that dominance. He finishes seventh in OPS with nine, with a 937. He was tied for fourth in OPS plus with 156 and tied for third in weighted runs created plus with 153. He led the league in walks with 93, and he also led the league in offensive war in 1961. And he finished sixth in baseball reference war and fifth in fan graphs war. And he ended up finishing 17th in the MVP vote. And by the end of 1961, which was his age 29 season, he had the highest career B war by a third baseman. How about that? Not even 30 yet. And he's already the greatest third baseman of all time up to that point. And his his nine 30-plus home run seasons are tied for the most before an age 30 season. How about that? Nine 30 homer seasons before age 30. Unbelievable. And his nine seasons with 30-plus home runs and 80-plus walks are the most such seasons before an age 30 season. Now, in 1962, Eddie Matthews got injured on May 6th. He tore ligaments in his right shoulder on a swing. He missed eight days, thankfully, uh, and then came back. But apparently, he was never quite the same after the injury. He finished 10th in OPS, still in the top 10 regardless, 877 there, tied for 7th in OPS plus with 137, and 7th in weighted runs created plus, also with 137. He led the league in walks with 101, he finished 8th in B-War and 5th in F-War and 29th in the MVP vote. So then in 1963, we're kind of winding down of the peak of Eddie Matthews, still getting it done. This was also a very uh, pitcher-friendly year. So, you know, his OPS, his OPS was 852, but he still finished 7th in OPS. He finished 5th in OPS Plus with 147 and fifth in weighted runs created plus with 148. He also led the league in walks with 124, a career high in walks. And he also led the league in on-base percentage with 399. And he, fin he finished, uh, he tied for third in baseball reference war, and he finished third uh, alone on fan graphs war, with fan graphs war. And this was his eighth season with seven plus baseball reference for and no other third baseman in baseball history up to that point had more than three seasons with seven plus baseball reference for dominating dominating the third base position again mm -hmm. like no one had ever seen before and you know this winds down his peak which i would say it lasted 11 years he just he didn't really slow down for 11 years. And from 1953 to 1963, he had five plus B war in every single season. And no one else during the stretch did that. How about that? Five plus B war for 11 consecutive seasons. Not going to see that very many times. And also from 1953 to 1963, his average season consisted of a 283, 393, 543, 936 slash line, a 155 OPS plus, a 154 weighted runs created plus, 36 home runs, 101 RBI, 100 walks, 7.2 B war, and 7.2 F war. Also from 1953 to 1963, minimum 4,000 plate appearances. He was sixth in on-base percentage, seventh in OPS, fourth in OPS plus, fourth in weighted runs created plus, 
second in walks, second in RBI to Hank Aaron. And he led the league in home runs from 1953 to 1963. Also, uh, winding, winding down the stretch, from 1953 to 1963, he was third in B-War and also third in F-War during this 11-year stretch. This is playing with guys like Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Mickey Mantle, Frank Robinson, Roberto Clemente. He's still finishing third in B-War and F-War. And Eddie Matthews, uh, basically for the ne next three years, he's kind of riding it out with the Braves. He's a producer, but he's not necessarily producing the same way he was before the age of 30. He set career lows in average with 233, slugging with 412, OPS with 756, and OPS plus with 112 in the year of 1964. Uh, but on August 20th, 1965, he hit a home run that made him and Hank Aaron combine for 773 home runs as teammates, uh, which was recognized by many as the most home runs hit by two teammates in a career. This is kind of a, you know, it can, the stats can get confused a little bit um, from be, because uh, from Lou Gehrig's first season to Babe Ruth last season in New York, they actually combined for 859 home runs. However, um, uh, Lou Gehrig only pitched or only played 23 games in his first two seasons. So some do not count that, and rightfully so. You know, it was all Babe Ruth in 1923 and 1924. There wasn't really a com combined effort. No. Um, but, but anyway, uh, even, even, you know, Lou Gehrig, from Lou Gehrig's first season to Babe Ruth's last season, they combined for 859 home runs. You could say that. But Matthews and Aaron together would go on to hit 863, blowing past even that number, uh, which remains, and, you know, these 863 home runs as teammates remain a record. Uh, Hank Aaron hit 442, and Eddie Matthews was right up there with him, uh, hitting 421. So he hit 32 home runs with an 810 OPS, 6 OPS plus, and 129 weighted runs created plus in 1965. And 1965 was his 10th 30 home run season. And up to that point, no other third baseman had more than two 30 home run seasons. He had five times as much as anybody else, at least. And the team ended up moving to Atlanta in 1966. And he was the only player to play for the Braves in Boston, Milwaukee, and Atlanta. He played for three different cities with one team. Not everyone can say that. And in 1966, he had a 761 OPS, 108 OPS plus, and 111 weighted runs created plus. And after the season, he was traded to the Houston Astros with Arnold Umbach and Sandy Alomar for Bob Bruce and Dave Nicholson. And the news of this trade actually made him cry, and understandably so. No, nothing wrong with that, Eddie. So now he has a brief, brief stint with Houston in 1967. And on July 14th, the anniversary that's actually just passed, he became the seventh member of the 500 Home Run Club. And by the way, this is only audio. Yep. And here we go. And nobody out here. Ron Marichal scratches the pitch. Oh, there's a deep right field. Way back round number 500 for Eddie Matthews. Matthews has just hit the golden 500. Well, it's stalled. Cross in front of him, and this has got to be a tremendous thrill. The entire Astros bench is up. Eddie Matthews has just hit his 500 home run. And the entire Astro bench is coming out of the dugout to score that Matthews. So there it is. By the way, can we acknowledge that it was off Juan Marichal? Yeah, that's like, big time. That's so screwed. Yeah, how often does a Hall of Fame hitter hit his 500th yeah. home run off a Hall of Fame pitcher? 
I don't know. I mean, well, uh, A-Rod hey, I got his 3,000th hit off Justin Verlander. Wow. That's a fun fact. Yeah. I didn't know that. His number is 3,000. It was a home run. It was So, uh, possible future Hall of Famer with definite future Hall of Famer. Yeah. That's, that's a different conversation for another day. Uh, yeah. Anyway, in 1967, Eddie Matthews had a 714 OPS and a 108 OPS plus with the Houston Astros. And on August 17th, he was traded to the Tigers for Leo Marinette and Frank Ladding. So, Frank Ladding. So, uh, Eddie Matthews kind of makes his mark with Detroit, not on the field, but off the field, uh, pretty much immediately. And mm-hmm. according, this is, the, uh, this is the story according to Society of American Baseball Research. It says, quote, Eddie displayed his leadership medal on his first day as a member of the Tigers when he discovered that not all of his new teammates were content with manager Mayo Smith. When he walked into the Detroit clubhouse for the first time, Matthews spotted a chalkboard uh, on which an anonymous Tigers player had written, we'll win, we'll win it despite Mayo. Eddie erased the offending message and gave his teammates a lecture on the importance of supporting their manager. Quote, "That, that little episode made me a friend of the whole team because some idiot had written that down there, recalled Matthews. Matthews then again says, starting from that moment, I was accepted right away. And then uh, Detroit general manager, Jim Campbell uh, went on to say, you don't, ac- you don't appoint guys to be leaders like that. They, e- they either have it in them uh, to take over or they don't. And Eddie had it. We knew when we traded for him, uh, we got, or no, we knew that when, when he, we, uh, we knew that when he traded, we knew that when he, we traded for him. You can do it, Chris. Take a deep breath. I was, I was get very, I was get very deep into it. And then yeah. I'm also very self-conscious when I read these quotes and it's single space. It's not great. Uh, and then <laughs> Detroit general manager, Jim Campbell also said, we got him as a player but we got him to be a leader too. Even K-Line looked up to him. He took a lot of pressure off Al. So for the rest of the season, uh, in which, after which uh, Eddie Matthews uh, went to Detroit, he had a 753 OPS and a 120 OPS plus in 36 games. Uh, however, the Detroit Tigers lost the pennant by one game in 1967. Uh, also, this was this was Eddie Matthews's 16th qualified season with an OPS plus of 100 or better, which are the most such seasons before an age 36 season. So, Eddie Matthews was an above average hitter his entire career. Had 16 seasons proving he was right. an, he was an above average hitter, and no one else had done that uh, before. No one else had done that that many times before their age 36 season. Pretty good. So before 1968, Detroit t- decided to name Matthews uh, as their manager when he was done playing third base. And he platooned with first baseman Norm Cash until Cash established himself as an everyday starter. And he, he had back problems that flared up, and he had to get a disc removed on July 5th of that year. And in 1968, he posted a 665 OPS, 98 OPS plus, and 99 weighted runs created plus. He was almost, almost average for one more season. Uh, and it was only in 57 plate appearances, too, so it's not like it was much. However, the Tigers went 103 and 59 and won the American League pennant. And Matthews went one for three with a walk in the World Series. And the Tigers won the World Series, and Matthews was a championship again, was a champion. And Eddie Matthews decided after that 1968, he'd had enough, and he called it a career, hung up the cleats, and retired. So uh, Eddie Matthews retires definitely as the greatest third baseman uh, of all time at the time. Uh, Yeah, he retired as that. And uh, this leads into an early edition of... 
So here's some good stats. When he retired in 1968, he led all third basemen in career games, plate appearances, runs scored, RBI, home runs, offensive runs above average, offensive war, and war. Among those who played at least 50% of their career games at third base, Matthews's 512 home runs were 82% better than the next best at who had 282. How about that? His 532.7 offensive runs above average were 57% better than the next best who had 339.2. His 93.7 offensive wins above replacement was 58% better than the next best, who had 59.4 offensive wins above replacement. How about that? And his 96.2 baseball reference war was 52% better than the next best third baseman's baseball reference war when he retired. The next best third baseman at the time had 63 Point one baseball reference for. How about that? And lastly, his 96.1 Fangraphs war was 60% better than the next best and the next best uh, next best third baseman at the time, according to F war, had 60.1. Matthews's F war was 60% better. So Eddie Matthews is now in his post career, and the Tigers GM offered Matthews a job uh, to scout for the team, but Matthews politely rejected that. He went into business, which unfortunately for him ended up failing pretty quickly. He was hired by the Braves as a coach in 1971 and was named manager in August of 1972. And he went 149 and 161 as a manager before getting fired mid-season in 1974. And he was actually threatened to be fined or suspended by Commissioner Bowie Kuhn after saying that he would bench Hank Aaron until they came back to Atlanta with him at 714 home runs. Which is a little crazy, but, you know, I guess that's, you know, they wanted to, to get done at that point. Well, and Bowie in Kuhn, 1994. Bowie Kuhn has, a, has definitely an odd reputation as, a, as an yeah. owner. He was also the guy that... Uh, suspended Fergie Jenkins permanently, which lasted about yes for, for marijuana possession, right? Yeah, drug possession, and that ended yeah. up getting overturned in like two weeks. Yeah, that was a big yikes. Uh, yeah, that guy was a little too too crazy with the uh, the punishment hammer. Anyway, yeah. in 1994, Eddie Matthews published an autobiography. And he admitted that his alcohol intake caused him to lose several baseball jobs. And he died on February 18th, 2001, at the age of 69. So uh, in this post-career, Eddie Matthews definitely had, there was definitely some controversy. First, it started with the, uh, the all-time centennial team. So after the 1968 season, Commissioner Bowie Kuhn, uh, decided to have a vote for the all-time centennial team by both fans and sports writers uh, in honor of the 100th anniversary of Major League Baseball. You know, the, the 1869 Cincinnati Red Stockings. Yeah. Who can forget that? And I mean, despite, yeah. despite Matthews clearly, clearly, as we've, as we've stated, clearly being the greatest third baseman of all time up to that point, uh, he was not even voted as a finalist uh, in this mm-hmm. in this all-time centennial team, and uh, you know, on his first ballot for the Hall of Fame, getting into the Hall of Fame, on his first ballot for the Hall of Fame in 1974, he only got 32.3 percent of the vote, and it ended up taking him five ballots to get inducted into what is wrong with people into the Hall of Fame. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> It's, uh, it's quite, un- quite unbelievable. Oh, my God. Yeah, it seemed, uh, and it seemed there might have been a, a bit of a, maybe like a, a Kurt Schilling effect. I'm not sure. Probably not. Uh, definitely different situation, but somewhat similar. So this is according to uh, Joe Piznanski's 
uh, the Baseball 100, the, uh, the article that he did on Eddie Matthews. Uh, this one said, this says, quote, to be clear, Matthews was not always an easy man to like. He clashed often with sports writers and photographers and players and, well, basically anyone who wasn't a teammate. In his career, he had epic fights with Frank Robinson and Don Drysdale. Eddie almost demolished him, Henry, Henry Aaron remembered, and almost came to blows with Jackie Robinson. He never hid his contempt for opponents. The other team, he would say, is the enemy. So he definitely had a bad relationship with uh, sports writers, which definitely, especially back then, they did not hold back. They did not hold back in terms of, you know, taking you off some sort of ballot uh, when they did not like you. That's why, that's probably why Ted Williams uh, lost a couple MVPs because he was not very friendly with the media. And that leads into Eddie Mathis's all-time ranks, which don't lie, which are undeniable. You know, it takes a few hundred writers to vote you into the Hall of Fame. Eddie Matthews did this all organically. He finished 24th in career walks uh, er, all time. He is. he is 24th in career walks, 23rd in career home runs, 23rd in position player baseball reference war, and 22nd in position player F war. So in all those, basically he is a top 25 all-time position player in baseball history. And many people don't really don't know much about him. Not at all. And among those who played 50% of games at third base, uh, Eddie Matthews ranks second in both in uh, second in home runs, baseball reference war, and fan graphs war. Um, so currently, he's probably the third or the uh, the second greatest third baseman of all time, uh, behind Mike Schmidt. And here are some here are some more how about that's you know we we had a we had a how about that thing in the early edition uh, for when you know right after he retired he was far and away the the greatest third baseman of all time so had to do that and now we're continuing the the uh, segment of how about that so Eddie Matthews and Hank Aaron uh, have more seven win seasons in the same season than any other national league duo they had five they had five separate seasons where they both had a seven win season 1957 1959 1960 1961 and 1963 no other pair of position players uh have done that five times how about that and his uh Matthews' eight seasons with 100-plus runs scored as a third baseman remain the most in the modern era. How about that? Also, his four 40-home run seasons as a third baseman remain the most. How about that? And his 48 multi-home run games as a third baseman remain the most since game logs started being recorded in 1904. So that leads into his legacy. Um, there's a lot of things you can say about Eddie Matthews simply because, you know, a lot of, you know, you don't really hear a lot about Eddie Matthews. So it's important to kind of emphasize him now. And, you know, it starts off him and Eddie Matthews and Hank Aaron are likely the greatest offensive duo in National League history. You know, American League, you definitely have yep. uh, Gehrig and Ruth. But him and Hank Aaron on the National League are probably undisputably the greatest offensive duo in National League history. I mean, you got two members of the of the 500 home run club. You know, they both hit – while they were both on the team, they both hit 400 home runs. It was quite unreal, um, especially by standards back in the day. It must have been undeniable. And Eddie Matthews was a model of consistency – you know, most players we talk about uh, on this program, on this history series, most most of those guys have shorter peaks, you know, probably better peaks, but definitely shorter peaks. Mm -hmm. But Matthews was consistently a top five National League player for 11 years. 
but he was never really quite the best National League player. You know, he never never led the league in, in position player war, and I believe he, he has the highest really position player war. Yeah, he he has the highest position player war for someone who never led the league in position player war, I believe, all time. Uh, so it definitely shows how, you know, he was never quite the best, but he really was sort of the best. And I think I think a stat that represents his consistency and not being, you know, unbelievable, but not really being bad at all, is uh, him and Hank Aaron, uh, coincidentally enough, have the most seasons with a baseball reference war between 5.5 and 8.5. They had 11 seasons with a baseball reference war between 5.5 and 8.5. So basically it's like, you know, you're between a very good baseball player and a great baseball player, but not quite reaching the level of unbelievable. So he was a, he was a great baseball player for many years, but he never quite had those unbelievable years like, you know, a Willie Mays, a Mickey Mantle, um, plenty of other guys you could, you could mention. And also Eddie Matthews, you know, he, he was a great third baseman, but Mike Schmidt ended up being better. He was one of the best players of his time, but Mays and Mantle, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle were better. He was one of the greatest Braves of all time, but Hank Aaron was better even at the same time uh, that Eddie Matthews played. And also he was a World Series champion, but he didn't win as many as, you know, Mickey Mantle. And because of this, because of, you know, not quite being the best at really anything, he is, uh, he's definitely overlooked in baseball history, even though he's definitely a top 25 position player uh, in baseball history. So, um, ultimately, but ultimately how I see it in, you know, especially back then, they definitely recognized it. Ultimately, his legacy is being the first man to bring power offense to the hot corner. It was known as more of a, you know, low offense production, high defense production position. That all changed when Eddie Matthews came up. He set up the position for guys like Mike Schmidt, George Brett, uh, Adrian Beltre, Alex Rodriguez, and even today, Nolan Arenado, and definitely plenty more today, as you know, the power yeah. hitting third baseman is kind of becoming a staple of baseball um, in today's game. So, you know, Eddie Matthews, you got to give the guy recognition because he definitely, he'll never really get enough recognition because yeah. of, you know, these biases kind of against him. You know, when I when you ask a diehard baseball pl fan, like, who is the, the first great center fielder of all time? They're probably going to say Ty Cobb, and that's probably the right answer. When you ask who's the first great shortstop of all time, they're probably going to say Honus Wagner, and that's probably the right answer. When you ask them who the first great third baseman of all time is, they might be a little hesitant, and the answer is Eddie Matthews. That's a fact. Yeah, it's, it's definitely Eddie Matthews. He was... And especially his type of game. I mean, he uh, he had the most home runs as a third baseman uh, in his mm -hmm. age twenty five season. You know, he yeah, you know, power hitting. You know, he was he wasn't the first Hall of Fame third baseman, but he was the first guy that you're thinking, oh, this guy's one of the greatest of all time. Yeah, like top five in the game right now. Yeah, he was he was that guy. Um, and it, you know, it's an it's an honor to uh, to cover him, talk about him, yeah, talk about. I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah, talk uh, talk about him. Definitely overlooked in in baseball history, and I'm I'm glad we were able to do this, especially before the beginning of the 2020 season. It would have been hard to sit on this one. And that yeah, yeah. that pretty much ends it uh, with Eddie Matthews. Uh, hope you enjoyed the episode. Um, if you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and you want to watch the videos with us, we had a, with, with two videos today. Um, you can watch that on STBNL, uh, on, on our YouTube channel, STBNL with Christianta and Daniel Curran. And also, if you want to follow us on social media, follow us on Twitter. I am at Chris underscore Gianta. Follow Daniel 
at Daniel underscore Curran and follow us on Instagram, uh, our joint Instagram account. It is at SGBNL podcast. And as always, we would like to thank Baseball Reference, Fangraphs, and MLB on YouTube. Uh, their contributions to the show make it possible for us to give you all the stats and all the videos that we are able to give you on, on guys like Eddie Matthews. Yep, that is correct. That is correct. And uh, also Society of American Baseball Research as well. Um, yes. given, given me the lowdown on uh, basically the story off the field of Eddie Matthews. So that ends our Eddie Matthews part of the episode. And we hope to see everyone on Friday, tomorrow, uh, if you're listening uh, on the day of release. Uh, we're hoping to see you on Friday for our episode on the 2015 New York Mets. See you then.